In today's lesson, we're going to talk about how to combine functions using operations, investigating the domain of those functions, as well as looking at the composition of functions. I'm very disappointed to not be able to do this with you in person. So we'll start with finding the domain of a function. So recall, we have worked with real functions. So real functions, if you look for the domain of a real function, it's just all the inputs for which f is defined. We know sometimes there are values of x, domain values, that cause the function to be undefined. So if it's just a real function, it's just all real numbers that make the function defined. Now, if you're dealing with a polynomial function, the domain of a polynomial function, again, are just the real numbers that make the polynomial defined. And there shouldn't be any that don't work. Now, we just worked with rational functions, and we know that there were definitely potential for being domain values, x values, that could cause the denominator to be zero. So we would have to exclude those values. The denominator, q of x, cannot ever be zero. So we would begin with the real numbers and then subtract any potential values of the denominator that could equal zero. If we're dealing with a radical function, a real valued radical function, meaning we have a square root symbol or a, an nth root symbol, a radical symbol, we have to make sure we pay close attention to the root index. So whatever the root index is, we have to be very careful to be aware of whether it is even or odd. If we have an odd root index, the radicand, the value of the radicand, what's inside the radical, can be negative. However, if the nth root index is an even number, we have to exclude all values that make the radicand zero. So then our domain would just be all values of x that cause the radicand to be greater than or equal to zero. So let's look at a few examples. If we look at y equals f of x equaling c, we just have a constant function y equals c is a constant function, it is in fact a horizontal line. So if I think about the domain of a horizontal line, well, it's all real numbers. So the domain of a real valued function f equal f of x equal to c is just all real numbers. If I look at the next example, y equals x squared plus x minus 12, hopefully you recall that the graph of that type of function, a quadratic function, is a parabola. So we have to make sure that we understand that the domain values for all quadratic functions that open up or down is in fact all real numbers. Now, if we look at the next example, we see that we have a rational function. So what might we do first? We should look at the denominator and factor the denominator. So that's going to give me the product So those two factors are going to be x plus 4 and x minus 3. Now knowing what we know about rational functions, we have domain potential domain restrictions. We have to look at the denominator and see what would cause it to <coughs> equal 0. So if we set each of these equal to 0, 
we see that x equal negative 4 and x equal 3 are domain restrictions. So if I were to have to write the domain of this function, if I put it in interval form, negative infinity to negative 4, we have to exclude negative 4. Negative 4 to 3, we have to exclude 3. And 3 to positive infinity. In the next example, this radical function, we have to investigate the radicand. So if I investigate the radicand, since the root index is 2, I know that the radicand can't be less than 0. So I'm going to go ahead and set the radicand equal, well, greater than or equal to 0. And I'm going to solve for x. And I get x squared has to be greater than or equal to 1. So what is that going to give me? That is going to give me a domain of x such that, and I can write this inequality to represent my domain restrictions. But if I were to think about how I would graph this on the number line, well, I would look at 0, 1, and negative 1, and x has to be greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to negative 1. Now if I look at the next example, again another radical function, the root index is still 2, so again I have to set the radicand greater than or equal to 0 and solve for x. And if I solve for x, I see that x squared is greater than or equal to negative 1. Now think about this. For what values of x is this statement true? This is always true because if you square an x value, whether it's positive, negative, or 0, it will always be greater than negative 1. So the domain of this function is all real numbers. Now in the next example, example f, we see that we have a root index of 3. So that is odd. So that is okay to have a negative value inside the radicand. The root index is 3, so therefore, when is, when is this going to be undefined? Never. The domain of this function is all real numbers. Now looking at example G, we have to pay very close attention to denominators in fractions that could be equal to zero, causing the function to be undefined. In this case, the only denominator that we need to worry about is right there, that x. So what is this telling us? If I set the denominator of my complex fraction equal to zero, and try to look at what x values could cause this to be undefined, we see that x can never be equal to 0. So that is the restriction on the domain that we have. Our solution is 4, so if x is equal to 4, what do we have? We have 4 over 4 minus 1, which would cause the entire denominator to be 0. So in fact, we have two domain restrictions. x cannot equal 0 in the original, causing that fraction to be 0. But then x cannot equal 4 or it would cause that first term in the denominator to be 0. So we have to exclude both 0 and 4 from our domain. Now we're going to talk about combining functions using those algebraic operations.
Again, we have to investigate the domains of each of these functions and the result of performing these operations. Now we're just adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing fractions. So this isn't really so hard, but we do have to pay attention to the, the denominator that would cause these functions to be undefined. So this is your sum function. Your difference function is this. Your product function is represented like this. And your quotient function is represented like this. It's just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So if you are given two functions, f of x and g of x, and you are asked to perform the sum function, you're just adding the two functions together. So this isn't hard. So we are taking f of x and we are adding g of x to it in the sum function. So what is f of x? 3x minus 2. And I'm going to add g of x, which is x squared minus 2x plus 4. I'm just combining like terms. So if I combine like terms, what am I going to get? I'm going to get x squared, and then I'm going to combine the 3x and the minus 2x to give me plus x, and then I'm going to combine the negative 2 and the positive 4 to get plus 2. So my sum of the two functions is this quadratic equation. And what is the domain for the sum of these two functions for a quadratic equation that opens up or down? All real numbers. Now let's look at the difference between f of x and g of x. Again, I'm going to write each of the functions, 3x minus 2, minus the entire second function g of x, x squared minus 2x plus 4. So be careful, we're going to have to distribute, we're going to have to subtract each of those terms in the second quadratic trinomial from like terms in f of x. So if I were to perform the operation, I would get negative x squared, and then I'd get 3x minus negative 2x, which is 3x plus 2x, which would give me plus 5x. And then I would combine minus 2 minus a 4, which would give me negative 6. So here is the difference of those two functions. Now this is just a parabola opening down. So what is the domain of the difference? all real numbers. Now let's take the product of the two functions, f of x multiplied by g of x. f of x again is 3x minus 2. g of x is x squared minus 2x plus 4. So I have to distribute. I have to distribute the 3x to each of these terms and then I have to distribute the negative 2 by multiplication to each of these terms. So if I were to do that, I would get 3x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x. So I've distributed the 3x to each of the terms in the second parentheses, and now I'm going to distribute the negative 2 to each of those terms, and I would get negative 2x squared plus 4x minus 8. 
Now I just have to combine like terms. So I have x squared terms. So if I start to write the product, I'm going to get, oh, I'm sorry. I accidentally underlined that one. That is not an x squared term. That's an x squared term. This is not an x squared term. So I have only one x cubed term. So that's 3x cubed. Now I'm going to combine my x squared terms, which would give me negative 8x squared. Then I'm going to combine my x terms, which would give me plus 16x. And then I have one constant minus 8. So the product of the two functions is this cubic function. Now recall what the domain of a cubic function looks like. The domain of the product, that little s, is all real numbers. Now in the last example, we're taking the quotient f of x divided by g of x. So that is going to give me 3x minus 2 in the numerator and x squared minus 2x plus 4 in the denominator. Now, we would have to be able to figure out the domain restrictions. Now, can you factor the denominator of that rational function? You know, you can always use the quadratic formula. If you were to use the quadratic formula, you're going to get complex roots. Well, if we're trying to determine the real valued functions with domains, then the domain here would in fact be all real numbers since our roots of our denominator are complex. Okay, now we're gonna talk about composition of functions. How do we take the composition of functions? What is a composite function? How do we form a composite function? We take the composition of two functions. So the way you represent taking the composition of two functions, let's say f and g, we represent a composition as f and then this open circle that represents composed with g. So we read this as f composed with g. So both f and g are going to be functions of x. f and g are going to be functions of x. So if I want to show the composition, I can represent it with this little open circle showing that I'm taking the composition of those two functions, f and g. However, I can represent it using another notation. And this is read f of g of x. So I'm feeding g of x into as my input of f. So I have some x's, and I'm feeding those x's into my function g. So we're working from the inside out of this composition, if it's in this notation. I am going to feed x's into g to get g of x. So these are outputs of g. Those outputs of g, I'm then going to turn around and feed them into my other function as my input into f. So my output is the f of g of x. So I'm feeding my results g of x into f. So let's talk about how we actually do that with functions. So we have two functions, a linear function Sorry. We have a linear function, f of x, and in this case we have a quadratic function, g of x. The first thing we want to do is find the composition f composed with g. 
So I'm taking the composition f of g. Now remember, we can represent that as f of g of x. So I'm feeding g of x into f. So I'm going to start with my outside function f of x. So I have f of x, oops, f of x equals 3x minus 2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed in g of x. That was hideous. I'm going to feed in g of x into f of x. So that means everywhere I see an x, I'm going to replace that with g of x, meaning this function. So that's going to be f of g of x. So how would I write that? Equals 3 times g of x. g of x is x squared minus 2x plus 4 minus 2. So all I've done is I have replaced my input of x values, my input into f with g of x. I've replaced my input into the function f with g of x. Now I just have to distribute and combine like terms. So that's going to give me 3x squared minus 6x plus 12 minus this little 2 that was outside. And if I combine like terms, my composition f of g of x equals 3x squared minus 6x, and then if I combine those, plus 10. So there is my composition. So order matters. f of g of x does not necessarily equal g of f of x, and let's go ahead and show that. So in the next example, we are now taking g, and we are composing it with f. So we're going the other way. So remember, we work from the inside out. So on our outside, we have g of x. So I'm going to start with g of x. And I'm going to now feed in for my domain values of g, f of x. So I have g of, and I'm going to input f of x. So everywhere I see an x in my function g, I'm going to replace that with my function f of x. So in this case, I have 3x minus 2 squared minus 2 times f of x, is, which is 3x minus 2, plus 4. Now, this is a binomial squared, so I have to FOIL. So let me rewrite that. It's 3x minus 2 times 3x minus 2, and then I'm going to go ahead and distribute. Minus 6x plus 4 plus 4. If I continue to FOIL, I would get 9x squared minus 6x minus 6x, which would give me minus 12x plus 4, and then I still have this minus 6x, and I'm going to combine the two plus 4s to get plus 8. So g composed with f is 9x squared minus 18x plus 12. Notice g of f and f of g, the composition of f with g and the composition g with f, are not the same. They can be, but they're not necessarily the same. Now, let's just for kicks go ahead and compose f 
with itself. So it seems weird, but it's, it's just an algebraic process. So I'm going to begin with f of x. And everywhere I see an x, I'm going to substitute in, again, f of x. So f of f of x equals 3, and then I'm substituting f of x in for x equals 9x minus 6 minus 2. So f composed with itself is 9x minus 8. Lastly, we're going to go ahead and take g and compose it with itself. So g composed with itself. So I'm going to start with g of x. And everywhere I see an x, I'm going to feed in g of x again. So g of g of x equals g of x squared plus, oops, minus. 2 times, again, g of x plus 4. So what am I going to have to do here? I'm going to have to multiply this quadratic trinomial by itself. Then I'm going to distribute the minus 2, and then not forget that plus 4. So go ahead and try that. Do the multiplication. If you have to, pause the video. Actually do it. And then you should be able to get g composed with itself to be x to the 4th minus 4x cubed plus... 10x squared minus 12x plus 12. Did you get it? If not, do it again. Okay, now we're going to talk about how to determine the domain of composite functions. It's just not a matter of looking at the composition of the two functions and determining its domain. Since you're feeding one function into another function, you have to take into consideration any restrictions on the inside function and then look at any restriction on the composition of the two functions. So you're going to start with all real numbers, and then you are going to subtract any restrictions on the inner function. So if I'm looking at d of f of g, I'm going to start with all real numbers. I'm going to subtract any restrictions on g and then subtract any restrictions on the composition. That's how you get your domain of composite functions. So let's look at this example. We have f of x, we have g of x. Now I want to find the domain of f composed with g. Now <clears throat> Recall f of g, which we found on the other page, was 3x squared minus 6x plus 10. This was the same two functions we used on the previous page. So to find the domain f of g, I start with all real numbers, and then, then I'm going to subtract any restrictions on G and then I'm going to subtract 
any restrictions on the composition F composed with G. So restrictions on the comp composite function. So I begin with all real numbers and I look to see what my restrictions on G are. This is a quadratic equation opening up, graph opens up rather. So I don't have any restrictions on that parabola. And then I'm going to look to my final composition and I see again that the graph of that equation is a parabola opening up. I have no restrictions on that. So the domain of the composition is all real numbers because I've subtracted nothing. Now let's look at the next example. I have f, I have my function g. So the first thing you might want to do is go ahead and find f of g of x. So I'm going to begin with f of x. And I'm going to input g of x in for x. So that's going to be f of g of x equals g of x squared minus 9. So that's going to give me, well, if I multiply this by itself, it just comes out of the radical. So I have 9 minus x squared minus 9, which is just negative x squared. So the composition is negative x squared. So to find the domain of the composite, I start with all real numbers. I'm going to subtract any restrictions on G, and then I'm going to subtract any restrictions on F of G. So this was a little aside. So what is that going to give me? All real numbers minus, what are our restrictions on this function? Well, remember, the restrictions on those func that function is that the radicand, sorry, So let's write this out as the domain of g, is that 9 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So if I solve for x squared, what do I get? I get x squared is less than or equal to plus or minus 3. So that means I have negative 3 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 3. Well, this is actually x squared. So let me write x. Should I show one more step? Let me show one more step. 9 is greater than or equal to x squared. I square root both sides. And I get x is less than or equal to plus or minus 3. So this is my domain restrictions on g. So how am I going to write that? I can write it in set builder notation. x such that 9 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. And then do I have any restrictions on my composition? No, it's a parabola opening down, so minus no restrictions on that. So what is my domain of the composition? I can merely write it as this. And I can even write it in interval notation. So that works as well. Now these are fun. Here you have been given h of x. And what is h of x? h of x is the result of taking the composition f composed with G. So think of it maybe this way, if it helps you to think of it this way.
F composed with G of X. Now these you have to be a little clever. You have to think of your result, your composition, and you have to try to figure out what two functions that you've taken the composition of yields this h of x. Now I would like you to try each of these, see if you can come up with them, and then check your answers. So, pause the video and try it. So if I look at this and recognize that h of x is equal to f composed with g of x, again that can similarly be written as f composed with g. If I let f of x equal x squared, knowing that I'm going to feed something in for this x, and I want it to look like this, then g of x would be 2x plus 1, because I'm feeding g of x into x of f of x. Do you see how you can get that with these two functions? So you kind of have to think about the big picture and then perhaps the input into the big picture. So let's try the next one. Hopefully you were able to get for f of x, the cube root of x, for g of x, meaning what we're substituting in for x, x squared minus 4. Because if I feed this into this, for f of x, I get this function. What about the next one? If I let f of x equal 1 over x, and I let g of x equal x plus 2, I'm feeding this in for x and I get my function. I hope you're able to see these, understand how to come up with them, and you have to be a little clever, but y'all can do it. Now, this one, well, a couple different ways we could do this one. What if I let f of x equal negative x plus 3 over 4 minus x. And I let g of x equal x squared. So that means I'm coming in and replacing these x's with x squared. See how that works? I think it's kind of neat. So these are my x's that I am replacing with x squared and I get this function. Now, is there another way to do it? Sure. There's lots of different ways we can do some of these functions. Not all of them, but if it works when you take the composition, then you've gotten it. Now, there is my math lab assignment for the 2.6 notes. In fact, there are two, so you should now try to do them. 